Tonight, from Baghdad, would-be Iraqi leaders begin planning their nation's future. But Iraqi citizens say, give us law, order, and water now. CBS News finds dozens of Russian-made missiles in the center of Baghdad, left behind by the fleeing Iraqi army. The spread and the dread of SARS, the disease may have mutated. It is now killing younger, healthier patients. And the latest U.S. spy scandal, sex, betrayal, and fraud, again at the FBI. the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather reporting tonight from Baghdad. Good evening. U.S. forces here in Iraq have scored another victory. They have captured the alleged mastermind of the 1985 murderous hijacking of the cruise ship Achille Laro. He apparently had been under the protection of Saddam Hussein. We get details of this still developing story from CBS News correspondent David Martin at the Defense Department. U.S. officials say Abu Abbas, a notorious terrorist who masterminded the 1985 hijacking of the Achille Loro cruise ship in the Mediterranean, has been captured by American forces in Iraq. Abbas, who had moved to Iraq to escape the reach of American law enforcement, is wanted for the murder of Leon Klinghoffer, a wheelchair-bound American passenger who was shot and tossed overboard. In Baghdad today, the fighting was limited to short, sharp bursts of rifle fire as Americans tried to make the city a safer place. But the number of U.S. troops inside Iraq is still growing. Now at 122,000 as the 4th Infantry Division moves in to relieve the Marines who control Saddam's hometown of Tikrit. But the orders for another Army division headed for Iraq have been canceled as the U.S. moves into a post-war phase. The commander-in-chief is not yet ready to call it victory, but he is certain Saddam Hussein, dead or alive, has been defeated. In Iraq, the regime of Saddam Hussein is no more. The president of France, who had so adamantly opposed the war, apparently agrees. He called President Bush for what the White House described as a businesslike conversation about the reconstruction of Iraq, the first time in two months the two leaders have spoken. Right now, America's biggest beef is with Syria for serving as an escape hatch for members of Saddam's regime, including some of the 55 most wanted. Today, the U.S. exacted a measure of revenge by shutting off a pipeline that carried about 200,000 barrels of Iraqi oil a day to Syria. One Iraqi who got out through Syria is the head of Iraq's nuclear program, who then went to the United Arab Emirates and turned himself in. He and Saddam's chief science advisor remained the highest ranking members of the regime in custody. Both are sticking to their story that Iraq has no weapons of mass destruction. And U.S. officials say they still have not uncovered any hard evidence of chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons. The science advisor has also told the U.S. that even without the war, Saddam was losing his grip on power and would have been gone in three years anyway. Dan? Here in Baghdad today, there was still a fair amount of shooting and from time to time loud explosions. But there are some signs of order returning to some parts of the city. In some neighborhoods, residents built roadblocks, trying to establish control over their own streets. In the city center, protesters jostled with U.S. troops, appealing for help in restoring order and public services such as water and electricity. Looters are still active, some apparently determined to burn what they can't steal. Against this backdrop, CBS's Mark Phillips reports, Iraqi factions gathered today to begin planning a new interim government. Three great religions began here near the biblical city of Ur, where believers hold that Abraham, the father of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, was born. But could a new Iraq be born here too? If today was any indication, it won't be easy. Delegates from formerly exiled opposition groups and community leaders from within Iraq were brought together to discuss the principles on which a new government would be based. I spent the night here last night. It's retired General Jay Garner's job to cobble together a working administrative arrangement. A successful meeting, he said, would be a fine way to celebrate his 65th birthday. What better birthday can a man have? than to begin it 
not only where civilization began, but where free Iraq and a democratic Iraq will begin today. And there was some good news. 13 points were agreed as a basis for a new government. Among them, that it should be democratic, that its leaders should be chosen by Iraqis and not imposed from outside, that Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party should be dissolved and have no future role. But while delegates began by thanking the U.S. and Britain for Iraq's liberation, this meeting also made the new Iraq's problems very clear as well. A large crowd gathered in nearby Nasiriya to protest against the imposition of even a temporary government by the occupying powers. And a major militant Shiite group, the Iran-based Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution, stayed away. So did the leader of the biggest formerly exiled opposition group, Ahmed Shalabi. Political stalemate has a practical effect here. Nasiriya's hospitals are full of the war injured who can't be treated because medicines and equipment can't be brought in until security improves. There are many needs in Iraq, medicine, food, water, in a word, order. But providing those in any kind of sufficient quantities will take a degree of political consensus that simply does not exist yet. Even Jay Garner admits any delay will lose momentum and make things worse. But delay is exactly what's happening. Mark Phillips, CBS News, Nasiriya. The situation here in Baghdad remains chaotic and dangerous. For U.S. forces here, the war, besides fighting now guerrilla-style attacks, has turned into a kind of huge cleanup operation. Everything from trying to get the city working again, to dealing with enormous stockpiles of weapons, and battling determined resistance fighters. All over Baghdad, U.S. military forces were doing their jobs today. At dawn, a special forces strike near the heart of the city. Their targets, some Saddam loyalists and Muslim fighters from other countries. The special forces support heavy armor. In another part of the city, Marines began the battle of helping Iraqis to rebuild this ravaged and still chaotic capital. They go back to the power plant, they can turn it on, and you'll have electricity. But this Baghdad neighborhood has a bigger problem. How many of them are there? The Marines went to search for the weapons in one of the many directions they were pointed. We went in another. And this is what we found. Russian-made frog surface-to-surface -surface missiles right in the middle of Baghdad, in plain sight, and not just a few, as many as 50. Whether these big rockets contain chemical or biological agents is unknown, and while they normally have a range of 50 miles, they could have been modified to travel farther, which would violate UN weapons regulations. What is known is that this neighborhood is living with enough firepower to blow up all of Baghdad. This stuff is very dangerous, and we are afraid it will explode on us and we maybe will be killed. And that's not all the fleeing Iraqi army left behind. The area is littered with unexploded ordinances and artillery. Abdul Razok Hamdan will be tethered to his four-year-old daughter until someone cleans up this mess. We need anyone to come to remove all the bombs and rockets, to remove the danger for our families. The Marines didn't get to this site before we left. By then, the people had taken on the dangerous job of cleaning up the ordinances themselves. But with all of the countless jobs the Marines and soldiers are taking on, there's no way to know if they'll be able to make it here anytime soon. In Saddam Hussein's hometown of Tikrit today, U.S. Marines set up special checkpoints trying to prevent fugitive officials of the regime from escaping. The Marines briefly came under fire as they secured the airfield outside the Tigris River City, about 100 miles north of Baghdad. No U.S. casualties reported. Tikrit is one of the few places in Iraq where statues and other monuments to Saddam remain intact. President Bush is hoping to turn his military success here in Iraq into political success at home. With his popularity rising, the president today put in a pitch for a new tax cut plan. CBS's Bill Plant at the White House has that story. The president hasn't talked publicly about the economy since the war began a month ago. But with his tax cut stalled, Mr. Bush kicked off a blitz of appearances by himself and his staff to push the package through Congress. 
We need tax relief totaling at least $550 billion to make sure our economy grows. American workers and American businesses need every bit of that relief now. The president's overall job approval rating in the latest CBS News New York Times poll is over 70 percent. But he and his advisors never lose sight of what happened to the first President Bush after the 1991 Gulf War, when he waited too long to pay attention to a stagnant economy. Today, a third of Americans believe the economy is the most important problem facing the country, far greater than Iraq or terrorism. And while only a third say things are getting worse, about half say the economy is stagnant. The president does get credit from a bare majority for paying enough attention to economic matters, but nearly as many say it's not enough. Of greater concern, the numbers are almost the same as for his father 12 years ago. So with the war winding down, the president will quickly now switch gears to persuade the public and Congress that the nation needs his tax cuts. And money can help families with purchases they have been delaying. That money will be in circulation, which will be good for our economy. Mr. Bush wanted $726 billion in cuts, but the Senate, with the support of several Republicans, says it won't vote for more than $350 billion. Democrat John Bro said Mr. Bush won't get more than that. The president is betting his political capital that Bro is wrong. Dan? I'll be back from here in Baghdad later in the broadcast with the story of looters answering the call of their religious leaders. The CBS Evening News continues now with Harry Smith in New York. Harry? Thanks, Dan. In Groton, Connecticut today, a very happy homecoming for 134 members of the U.S. Navy's silent service. The crew of the nuclear attack submarine USS Toledo returned from war duty in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. The sub fired numerous Tomahawk cruise missiles during the bombardment of Iraq. On the CBS Market Watch, American Airlines flight attendants are getting one more day to approve givebacks. The airline says it needs to avoid bankruptcy. Unions representing pilots and ground workers okayed their part of the deal. The manufacturing sector of the economy is still struggling. The government says output by American industry fell half a percent in March, the biggest decline in three months. Stocks managed a modest gain today. The Dow closed up 51 points. The Nasdaq, 6. Coming up next on the CBS Evening News, the SARS virus may have turned deadlier, and the economic fallout is getting wider and deeper. Health experts are growing more concerned about the new type of cold virus that causes SARS. The pneumonia-like disease has spread now to at least 20 countries, including the United States and Canada. At least 150 people have died worldwide, and more than 3,000 others are infected. Asia is still the hardest hit, with a record nine deaths reported in Hong Kong in just the past day alone. CBS's Barry Peterson is there. Just when Hong Kong officials thought SARS couldn't get worse, it has. While initial victims were elderly, the latest SARS deaths now include people as young as in their early 30s. Researchers suspect the virus has mutated into a more deadly form. To contain the spread, departing passengers will soon have their temperatures taken at the airport. Those with SARS symptoms will be going nowhere. That's more bad news for airlines flying their big jets with as few as three passengers. The main airline here, Cathay Pacific, may ground its entire fleet. But even healthy people here now have a SARS stigma. Malaysia and Saudi Arabia are banning almost everyone from SARS-infected regions. The Philippines asking them voluntarily to just stay away. <laughs> Meanwhile, tourist and business people staying away from Hong Kong are creating a litany of economic woe. Hotels more than 90% empty. 5,000 restaurants facing bankruptcy, 10,000 mom-and-pop stores at risk. Even the good luck dragon couldn't bring luck or customers to a major international trade fair in the Chinese province near Hong Kong. Americans especially were not to be seen. SARS has become so frightening here that even civil liberties may suffer. One human rights advocate is now suggesting that families of SARS patients be rounded up and sent to quarantine camps in the hills surrounding this city. Barry Peterson, CBS News, Hong Kong. 
The Environmental Protection Agency estimates thousands of pollution-related deaths will be prevented in coming years because of its new rules on diesel emissions. The EPA is proposing deep cuts in pollution from diesel engines used in farming and other industries. Last year, it ordered reduced emissions and cleaner fuels for diesel trucks. Still ahead on the CBS Evening News, a court hearing for the accused double agent for China, the woman at the center of the latest FBI spy scam. Authorities in Modesto, California say it could take days, even weeks, to determine whether a body found is that of 27-year-old Lacey Peterson. Her husband reported her missing on Christmas Eve, saying she was gone when he returned from a fishing trip. Lacey Peterson was eight months pregnant at the time, and the police are now analyzing the bodies of a woman and an infant boy that washed up on the shore near the Berkeley Marina. A Los Angeles courtroom was the venue today for a new chapter in the latest FBI spy scandal. It was a bail hearing for the woman prosecutors say is a double agent for China who had affairs with two former FBI agents. CBS's Sandra Hughes is on the case. Hiding behind the facade of successful Chinese immigrant turned American businesswoman, the FBI says Katrina Lee Young was really a double agent, sleeping with FBI agents and stealing secrets for China. Today in court, the U.S. attorney argued to keep her in jail, citing court documents in which she told the FBI she wanted to disappear. She allegedly admitted to having 2,100 contacts with Chinese officials and had their personal phone numbers and documents labeled secret by the FBI. The government claims Li Young, who was recruited as an FBI informant in the early 80s, was having an affair for 20 years with her FBI handler, now retired special agent James Smith. Leung described how Smith would come to her house and leave his briefcase open, which gave her the opportunity to take documents out of the briefcase and copy them without Smith's knowledge. During a search of her suburban Los Angeles mansion, several bank accounts were discovered. The FBI alone paid her $1.7 million over two decades and now faces years of damage control to its reputation and counterintelligence program. Here where you have it done over the course of close to 20 years, it, it multiplies really exponentially the level of difficulty in unscrambling what happened, trying to figure out what investigations may have been tainted. One damaging secret Li Young reportedly gave the Chinese led to it discovering that the presidential plane, the equivalent of Air Force One, had been bugged by the U.S. Katrina Leung's lawyers say she didn't do anything she wasn't directed to do by the FBI, that it controlled her every move and now wants to paint her as a criminal when she's really a loyal American citizen. Sandra Hughes, CBS News, Los Angeles. That's the news on the home front. I'm Harry Smith in New York. Dan Rather will be back from Baghdad with a surprising twist to the looting story when the CBS Evening News continues. The U.S. troops here in Baghdad find themselves doing a lot of non-combat work. And south of here, in Basra, British troops are delivering newspapers, what are said to be the city's first independent papers that don't take the Saddam slant on the world. The papers are put together by Iraqi journalists. The editors say the paper, Azaman, is for people who hold, quote, moderate views. In the power of vacuum in this capital, after Saddam and before a new line of authority, looting has been rampant. Some of it still goes on. But that's not the end of this tale about the thieves of Baghdad. CBS's Lee Cowan has the true story, complete with a moral. Of all the stories of Baghdad and bandits, this could be the worst. The looting of hospitals and schools and everything else in between. But while the authorities haven't caught up with the guilty, guilt has caught up with the faithful. Tonight, above the heads of those offering their daily prayers, are the spoils of war, all returned by the thieves who stole them. Why are they bringing it back? Because they're afraid of Allah. They're afraid of Allah. Afraid of Allah. From the decorative to the deadly, even the macabre. Someone actually stole that? Yes. It's all here. So much, it spilled over into a nearby field. Cans of cheese, bolts of fabric, tires, fan belts, all being catalogued to be returned to their rightful owners. I think they are regretted. 
they regret what they've done. This newfound crisis of conscience wasn't just born on its own. Without a government, without a military, and without a police force, really the only voice left here is the voice of Islam. And this week, that voice was preaching a message of fire and brimstone from a bullhorn, calling on all good Muslims to return what they had taken. Oh my God! This thief certainly got the message. So you and three children yes. grabbed that bookcase and put it on that card, and, uh, yes. stole it, and now you're bringing it back. Yes. Granted, this is only a small portion of what was stolen, but it's also a small sign that the cradle of civilization is getting a little more civilized again. Lee Cowan, CBS News, Baghdad. And that's part of our world tonight. Dan Rather for the CBS Evening News, reporting from Baghdad. Good night. For news 24 hours a day, log on to cbsnews.com. Iraq after Saddam, Dan Rather reports from Baghdad tomorrow. Experience CBS News.